Hello, I'm Chris Eden. I'm a high volume radical prostatectomist working in Guildford in London in the southeast of England. And I'm producing this video having been asked to do so by a large number of patients who want to know how best to prepare themselves for this operation. So my first tip is to understand what the operation entails. You don't need to understand it in enough detail to actually do the operation, but you do need to understand that the operation essentially involves removing the prostate and the seminal vesicles. These are the structures that lie at the back of the prostate and store sperm. And then joining the two structures either side of it, in other words, the bladder at the top and the urethra, which is the tube that you pass urine through, back together again. It sounds conceptually very easy. The reality is rather more difficult because the prostate is fairly inaccessible lying at the bottom of the male pelvis. The male pelvis is narrow because we don't have babies and also the structures around the prostate need to be carefully preserved in order to give you the best functional results, in other words the best bladder and sexual function after the operation. I assume that you've already gone through the discussion about your various treatment options depending on your age, your fitness, your Gleason grade, your PSA and your stage and that you've had an MRI scan and whatever other scans are necessary to stage your disease. And also if you've decided in favour of surgery that you've had the appropriate conversation about the number of operations your surgeon has done, the number of operations he or she does per year and the likely outcomes. But if you are overweight to lose some of that weight and the reason for this is if you are overweight you tend to get a lot of fat distribution within the pelvis which makes the operation more difficult and that increased degree of difficulty is usually translated into a longer operating time, greater blood loss and poorer functional results. So please help yourself if you are overweight to shed some of this weight. It's a fairly easy equation if your calorie expenditure exceeds your calorie intake you will definitely lose weight. It isn't a popular suggestion but it is an important one. Equally well for smokers please stop smoking even if you've been smoking for decades. Stopping smoking before the operation even for three weeks before will allow you to get over the operation faster. My third tip is to get fit and this isn't all about weight control it's also about the fact that if your body is fit then it's better primed to deal with any significant physical insult like having a major operation. If you are already taking regular physical exercise then increase the amount of cardio, in other words endurance exercise that you undertake and also some strengthening exercises. Resistance with weights would be good. If you're not already physically active then you ought to start with walking and gradually step up the uh, number of minutes per day that you walk for. My next tip relates to pelvic floor exercises. The pelvic floor supports the main valve of continence. It actually surrounds it. So if you have a strong pelvic floor after the operation, it will help your valve of continence to close. The valve of continence is not going to be in the best physical shape after the operation because it will have stitches in it. And these stitches will tend to tether it and prevent it from working completely normally. And this is why for some patients they may experience some stress urinary incontinence. In other words, if you cough, sneeze, stand up quickly or laugh, you may leak some drops of urine. This is controllable initially with pads. Younger patients won't have any stress incontinence at all. And if you have a retsis sparing approach, in other words, if you have what is a relatively new uh, form of access to the prostate which preserves the anchor points of the continence mechanism, 90% uh, of those patients don't have any stress incontinence after the operation. So if your pelvic floor is strong and you can get instructions on pelvic floor exercises online, on YouTube and also through the physiotherapy department of the hospital where you're going to be having your operation, then that will certainly decrease the amount of bother you have from urine leakage uh, and the duration of that urine leakage post-operatively. My advice so far is related to what you can do prior to your operation to help yourself to get the best result but on the day of the operation you'll be seen not only by the surgeon who will want to talk to you about the risks of the operation and answer any questions you have 
but also by the anaesthetist who will want to talk to you about your past medical history, drug history and so on, and will almost certainly offer you a spinal anaesthetic, in other words an injection in the back. This is a one-off injection uh, of a local anaesthetic and essentially numbs you from the waist down. And my advice is that if you are offered this, unless there is an overwhelming reason why you should refuse, such as complicated previous back surgery, which would make it difficult technically to do it, my advice is to accept that offer of having a spinal anaesthetic. And the reason for this is that most of the discomfort after a robotic prostatectomy uh, is experienced in the first two hours after you've woken up. And if you can wake up completely comfortably because you've had a spinal anaesthetic given to you beforehand, then it reduces your morphine requirement. If you don't have to have a significant amount of morphine after the operation, it means you'll be less nauseated. The probability of vomiting will be less. You'll have less constipation and less itching. So it's a good idea uh, to have a spinal anaesthetic. On the first morning after the operation you'll be visited by the surgeon and his team or her team uh, and they'll tell you how the operation went and exactly what was done in terms of nerve preservation. If you had frozen section analysis as part of your radical prostatectomy and this is a technique which is uh, designed to increase the amount of nerve preservation you can do because a pathologist will be looking at your prostate during the operation so the surgeon knows about the surgical margins during the operation and can remove more tissue if necessary. If you've had a frozen section you'll get the result of that. They will also want to run some routine blood tests, almost certainly start you off on a light diet as well and get you up and about and moving around. But when I say light dart, I do mean a light dart. There are some patients on the first day after the operation, because they are hungry, they generally haven't eaten for 24 hours, will eat too much. And you need to understand that if you've operated on the tummy, bowel motility is decreased for the first 24, 48 hours. And if you pile too much stuff in the top end, you will find that you get more bloated and more uncomfortable. So I would advise you to have tea and toast or its equivalent on the first morning, a bit more for lunch and then rather more for supper. If you're not feeling hungry, don't feel compelled to eat, but just carry on drinking. Don't be surprised if after the operation you have some abdominal distension. The reason for this is not the gas that's been used to help us during the operation distend the tummy, but it's due to the fact that bowel motility decreases after the abdomen has been operated on, but the bacteria in your bowel don't stop producing gas. So if you have some abdominal distension, the best thing to do is to decrease the amount you're eating, carry on drinking, but don't have as much to eat, and also to ambulate as much as you can. Walking around will significantly encourage bowel activity to return to normal and will help you to, to pass that gas through the bottom. Don't be surprised also if you have some blood in the urine. This is quite normal. It can last variably up to two to three weeks. If there is a lot of it, then you can dilute the amount of blood in your urine by drinking more. You ought to be drinking at least a glass or a cup of something every hour. If you've had a lymph node dissection in particular, and this applies more to patients with higher PSAs, Gleason grades and stages, then don't be surprised if you have some swelling of the penis or scrotum. This can be quite marked and it will go back to normal within two weeks. Don't be surprised either if you have some pain in the shoulder and the reason for this is that this tends to be gas which is trapped under the diaphragm and the diaphragm has the same nerve supply as the shoulder. So if you have shoulder pain after the operation, rest assured it will go. Constipation after the operation is also extremely common. Most patients won't have their bowels open until after they've gone home. And it's due to a combination of things, dehydration, the fact that you're starved prior to the operation, the strong painkillers that you've been given around the time of the operation, particularly morphine, and also immobility. And the best thing that you can do to decrease the duration of the constipation is to be up and about moving around and to make sure you don't get dehydrated. 
Don't be surprised after the operation if you feel tired. This is the body's reaction to having had something significant done to it. It will pass. It may persist to some extent for up to 12 weeks. This is called a stress response to surgery, but it will pass on its own. It's not at all uncommon after the operation to have mood swings, in other words, feeling emotional, and this is all part of the stress response to surgery and will also pass within the first few weeks. My next tip is that if you don't feel that you're making satisfactory progress for whatever reason, that you tell someone. Almost certainly prior to discharge, you will have been given a telephone number to ring, either the ward where you were after your operation before discharge, or one of the nurse specialists who will have introduced themselves to you. So ring someone up, tell them if you're worried, tell them if your catheter is blocked, if it's not draining correctly, if there's too much blood in it, if you're worried about your wounds, in other words, they look infected, there's an exudate from them or they're smelly. Tell them also if you feel unwell or if you have a fever. It is important to maintain a positive mental attitude but it's also important to speak up if things aren't quite right. After the operation, generally your catheter will be removed sometime between one and two weeks. If you have had a retsis sparing operation, then you'll have had a suprapubic catheter, which tends to be more comfortable. That tends to be clamped on the eighth post-operative day, and if you're passing urine satisfactorily, removed on the ninth post-operative day. If you've had a conventional prostatectomy, then generally that catheter will be removed after somewhere between 7 and 14 days. But this will be discussed with you after your operation and arrangements should be made for your catheter removal prior to discharge. Following the catheter removal process, you'll also be seen in the outpatient clinic, generally somewhere between three and six weeks after the operation. And the reason for that is to discuss the histology, in other words, the final analysis of your prostate and or lymph nodes if they've been removed. This is really important information because it has very strong prognostic significance. And unlike your biopsy and your MRI scan, which preceded the operation, the final histology is definitive and is a more accurate predictor of the probability of cure. After that, your PSA generally will be checked every three months for the first year, every six months, for the next two years and then once you've reached three years following surgery you'll be discharged back to your GP to have your PSA just checked once a year. If your PSA rises and the threshold for concern is a PSA of 0.2 or above then you ought to be referred back to the hospital. So I hope these tips have been useful for you and good luck with your radical prostatectomy. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them below. Thank you.